All right, welcome to another episode of the TFD Performance Podcast, joined again by TFD Senior Performance Dietitian, Jack Doherty, Combat Dietitian. Combat Jack, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me as always. Very cool topic today. I think this is one that most people in general will be able to relate to, but definitely athletes who are in weight category sports. This is an important conversation for them to hear. What we're going to be talking about is well, what we're going to be discussing is, is there a relationship between sporting performance and body composition? And I think anyone that has done any type of sport, have been anywhere around the health and fitness industry has probably felt the pressure of, I need to look a certain way in order to perform. But it's an interesting topic when you dive into it and you look at the research and you, you know, do what we do and you look at even anecdotes of all the clients we've worked with and, hey, this person looks like this and does this and this body fat percentage seems to do better than this. And it, it's interesting when you get into it. Let's start, Jack, like just, just off the bat, you've been in this for years and years. What's your initial impression when someone says to you, hey, I want to get down as low as a body comp as I can, I need to do real well. What's your initial thought process that you go through? Um, like, I think there's like a lot of like pressure from like from like a society pressure, sport pressure, social media kind of stuff in terms of, um, the perceived correlation between, um, you know, say a certain body composition. And what I mean by that is being, you know, super shredded, very lean, visible abs, popping muscles, that, that kind of look and how that's, you know, that perceived correlation between that and being the optimal athlete performing the best, feeling the best, um, I think personally, that's something that I discuss probably on a weekly basis with, you know, new clients, existing clients, people wanting to reach a certain uh, body composition. And I think that's what's important to talk about today is like what we've found in terms of that perceived correlation and the reality of what is actually happening or the reality of what is an optimal body composition for someone. Yeah, I think there's two parts to this because we're going to keep this relatively short. So two parts that we need to discuss before we get into kind of our experience with it and i think the first one is genetics and then the next one is body to weight ratio power to weight ratio which is a real thing i think genetics first and foremost there is a genetic predisposition to how you look i know that sounds pretty obvious but you hear a lot of people and they're like oh you know what like uh, if i just trained harder or if i did this i'll just look a certain way to an extent that is true like to an extent there is an amount of body fat you can lose or there is a way that you can increase your lean muscle mass and, and change the way that you physically look. But a large portion of that is dictated by your genetics. And I remember playing rugby, growing up playing rugby. I don't know if the listeners are familiar with, with rugby union or rugby league, like the forwards or the, or the big guys, the locks, the number eights, the props, I, the best example of the props, like the loose head and tight head prop or the hooker, they're the guys in the front row in a rugby scrum. And they're usually like the short stocky guys that don't generally have any necks. And I remember whenever I played with these guys, you look at their parents and they literally have the exact same body shape, right? They have that short, stocky body shape. And you see that in all different athletes, right? Like generally when you see like tall, lean people, their parents might be tall and lean as well. Like there's, a, again, there's a lot of factors that come into play with this, but a large degree of how your body looks is your genetics. And that's not saying that you can't change it. You absolutely can change it but there's to a degree. And I think that's first and foremost, something you have to appreciate. If you want to avoid this real mental rut, you can get yourself in. Like Jack said, if you're looking at these like magazines or taking in all of this societal pressure of, I need to be as sh diced and shredded as these people on the magazines and these physique athletes and bodybuilders, that creates such an unrealistic expectation of yourself, largely because there's such a huge genetic factor here at play. Yeah, 100%. I think like if if you even look at like, you know, the UFC, some UFC athletes, like some of the, the Polynesian guys like Tai Tuavasa and some of those guys, like, I think like genetically and um, probably from like an ethnicity base, like they hold more body fat. But to say they're not incredibly explosive, lots of muscle mass underneath there and they're incredible athletes. They're like Tai doesn't, you know, aesthetically look like the, you know, this... Um, you know, the, the, the idealized body or this, you know, shredded physique, but is he an amazing athlete? Is he performing at the top level? Is he knocking people out? Is he explosive? Yes. So again, like that's like one of the prime examples I say to people, I'm like, just because you don't have popping abs or 
uh, look a certain way that, you know, what society looks at the common athlete does not mean that you're not, you know, an optimal athlete or a high performing athlete. Yeah. And I think that's a good point, right? Because even look at like Tyson Pedro, guys like him, right? He can get extremely fit and quite lean, but he doesn't have a roaring six pack, right? And I always think when you look at the extremes of this is obviously bodybuilding and physique athletes. And I think a lot of people, especially our age who grew up where they were idolized, or I think back in the day, bodybuilders and physique athletes took up a lot of the rental space when it came to sports in terms of like magazines and what was openly accessible to people. So that contributed to what we thought the athlete look was. But I remember watching this documentary and it spoke about how Phil Heath, when he was going on his, um, whatever it was, when he was world champion or whatever they call it in the bodybuilding space. And he did it for like eight years. And then there was that, is it Kai Green or whatever the, the big, the big uh, dark fellas called super shredded. But the reason he couldn't beat Phil Heath was because his genetically, like the way that the muscles around his stomach were shaped, just didn't give the look that the judges were looking for that Phil had. So he always beat him because he, when they push their bodies well beyond their, you know, genetic physical limit, and they're obviously taking other substances and everything else to push that well, well, well beyond because genetically his muscle frame and the way his muscle bellies were created, he just never got the look that Phil had. And that's a real thing too, that people need to remember that even if you do push your body to the extreme limits, you still may not look the way that you want to look because you may physically just not have the muscle, you know, architecture that the person on the magazine has. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's what, I think that's the biggest problem in the sporting world or just in the, in the, like, you know, in the kind of sporting realm is just this comparison. The comparison is, is what's killing a lot of people's confidence is like, is like, you know, causing a lot of mental health issues and making people strive to, to, strive for things that are you know simply unrealistic and un <clears throat> unhealthy because again like you said like some people may be um let's for instance like 12 percent body fat some people at 12 percent body fat have very defined abs and like you know they have the striations in their muscles some people at 12 percent body fat simply do not and that's not because of anything other than uh distribution of fat and obviously said like just the structure and architecture of your individual body so i think that that self-comparison um, you know, to other athletes or to other individuals is something that plays a major role in um, this, this concept that we're talking about. Yeah, and this is the first major point I want to make, and it ties in nicely with this, is that there's a genetic difference, and we see this all the time in practice, right? There's a genetic difference between how people's bodies respond at certain body compositions, at certain body fat compositions compared to others. And what I mean by that is everyone's familiar. You've heard us talk about this concept of low energy availability. You don't have to flesh it out. It's a very incomplete idea, but the concept is, is very useful and very interesting. And the fact that to get your body composition down to like Jack was saying, to a point where you are showing abs or you're at 12% body fat, you have to be in a state of negative energy balance or at a calorie deficit for a prolonged period of time to your body to lose that body fat. People genetically respond differently to that. People respond very differently to that. And like Jack said, some people can walk around at 12% and that's more natural. That, that composition seems more natural for them. And they might not have any of these negative effects of say low energy availability. And they might be able to diet down further or diet to get to that. And they can do that without any metabolic damage, without any psychological damage, without any physical damage, physiological damage. They might be able to do that because their body Again, the architecture and the frame and the boundaries of their body allows that. For a lot of people though, when you go down to those body compositions, that's just simply not the case. You simply cannot get down to those body compositions without your body experiencing extreme negatives for your physical, mental, and physiological health. And you see this so much in sport and you see this particularly with female athletes. I've got female athletes that we work with. Again, they can walk around 12% body fat out of camp out of competition and they're completely fine. They have a regular period. All of their bloods are fine. Their mood's great. You know, they, they can train really well, hit great numbers in the gym. But I've got other athletes that, female athletes that uh, tw walk around 20%. I take them anything lower than 18, 17% body fat. All of a sudden, they start experiencing these really negative consequences of being in LEA. And I'm sure if you really extended that out and you do it in a tiny deficit and you did it for a long period of time, yeah, maybe 
maybe you could get them down lower, but it's just not worth it. And so I say to them, hey, look, your body much prefers to be up here and you're hitting way better numbers up here. This is your ideal performance weight. Forget this idea of getting down to 12% and looking completely shredded like her. This is where you're going to be the best athlete. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think that's the conversation that I've been having more and more of recent when, you know, people discussing, you know, this concept of, oh, I want to get my body fat as low as possible. And this is what I discuss with them every time. I'm like, there's such individual variation. As you said, like I've had some guys who can be absolutely shredded to the bone, very low body fat percentage and can feel completely fine, blood work fine, performing optimally. But there's other guys who, if you, you know, again, if you get them today's low body fat percentages, they start to feel terrible. Their hormones start to, you know, their testosterone starts to be suppressed. Their training goes, their mood decreases. And then also like, I have like friends who are bodybuilders. And then what they say to me is the biggest quote that I always remember is the better they look or the more competition ready they look, the worse they feel. So yeah, you see them on like, my mate is a, one of my friends is like a competitive bodybuilder. And he says all these photos of him. He goes, when I'm like this, I feel horrible. He goes, my libido is non, non, non-existent. My mood is terrible. I have no energy. I hate training. I have no energy to get out of, uh, out of bed. So again, like, yeah, so it's perceived that he looks fantastic and everyone kind of wants to strive for this. But he says that, you know, in every other aspect of life, he just is absolutely miserable. And, you know, that can't really function as a, as a human, if not just a man. So I think that's something that not really discussed. You see all these images, but you don't see the repercussions of looking these certain ways. I think it's idealized, but not you're not really thinking about the health aspect and the, you know just the you know how, how you're feeling as as a person in general. Yeah, and I don't want to slag off bodybuilding and physique athletes because it takes a a whole lot of discipline and commitment to do that sport. It's just you have to call a spade a spade. And at the end of the day, when it comes to energy outputs and energy demands, and you compare it to other sports it's very low, right? Like the energy output of going to a gym, picking up weights, even if you have a hard session does not compare anywhere near to a wrestling session, MMA. If you're going to go do any other sport, really, you're not going to burn. So yeah, you could probably get away doing that in that environment where the performance aspect is so low, where that barrier is so low. Any sport that requires any degree of performance, you can't get away with being in that state. And this is where it's really important. This is where that conversation becomes more interesting when we talk about, okay, well, what about power to weight ratio sports? Like when we look at things like athletics, we look at rowing, we look at throwing sports, we look at riding sports, we even look at running, you look at weight category sports, like combat sports. These are all power to weight ratio sports where the amount of power you can produce at a certain weight will have some type of factor in how competitively successful you are. So that's a very interesting conversation. But again, it's very individual. It's very individual because you might get down to a certain weight where theoretically you would be very powerful and your power to weight ratio would be very good at that weight if you can maintain that weight. But to get to that weight, you've had to sacrifice all these other things and you've gone through all of these negative consequences with your health, your physical health, your mental health, physiological health that you just can't produce the power. So you go into the gym and you just hit terrible numbers. So now you're at a lighter weight and you're weaker. So that power to weight ratio just doesn't work out. And this is where it's really important to work with someone who knows what they're doing to find, okay, what is your best power to weight ratio for your body that you can sustain? And this is why I love working alongside good S&C coaches and within a good team, because when you're constantly tracking these numbers over, like say fight camps, what we do with our top level athletes, it's clear as day. It's clear as day where their ideal weight is. And we actually use these measurements to hit a gauge of what weight we want these guys coming back into the fight, into the cage at come fight night and where we want to spend most of our time of fight camp out. And I use that information to plan what our nutrition strategy will be. Like Alex Volkanovsky is the best example of this. We track all of these numbers and we have a very clear number, which is Volk's best power to weight ratio weight, where he's most powerful, most explosive, but still has a great power to weight ratio. And that's where we'll hang out for most of the camp. And then that's where we aim to get back to after weigh-ins when he's going in the cage. We don't want to be heavier. We don't want to be lighter. We want to hit that number. But that number is very specific and very individual for you. And it may not look like you being super shredded. It may actually look like you having a bit of extra body fat on you so you can be more, more powerful and make that power to weight equation more favorable for you. 
Yeah, I think that's that's something really important that, that we speak about with all our athletes. I think that, you know, obviously body image is a, is a major factor. I think at whatever level people, you know, want to look a certain way or, they, you know, they're, they're worried about the way they look. But the conversation that I'm having more and more these days is that are we going to concentrate on aesthetics or are we going to concentrate on the variables we spoke about, power to weight ratio, how you're feeling, how you're performing, how your mood is, how your libido, all the things that that make you more so the optimal athlete rather than just the aesthetics look. So I know people want to look a certain way, but I think more and more now I just have these discussions. And I want to say, I say discussions because I'm not telling people what they have to do or have to look like. But I always just go back to, I'm like, let's look at the variables that actually, you know, you know, what, what am I trying to say? They, they look at the variables that explain how we're performing as an athlete, how we're doing as an individual in everyday life. Those are the things we should concentrate on rather than this kind of this constant focus on aesthetics and aesthetics only. Because yeah, obviously like, you know, in the, in the especially in the UFC, like it's all the, the way people look is idealized. Like, you know, Michael Chandler comes out and when he's fighting and he's looking absolutely in phenomenal shape and they kind of idealize that. Look how fantastic look. They always go on about it. So people always feel drawn to like pursue this certain look. But again, like we said, it's so individual. I think that we, we need to start focusing on the things, the variables we just spoke about in terms of figuring out how we can optimize ourselves as an athlete rather than just trying to look like someone in the UFC or trying to look like someone off Instagram. Yeah, I think an important thing to note here as well, as much as we're talking about, yes, you need to do everything that you can, you know, to optimize your performance. There are anthropometric, which means your body shape factors that do play a role in how successful you will be at a certain sport and there's no wonder like when you look around certain sports that very successful people in that sport share similar body characteristics right like you look at runners like look at the kenyan runners and you look at them they've got the long legs long arms and they've got you know very very good natural vo2 maxes it's these things like all these characteristics this all these characteristics that are conducive to success in that sport like you look at sprinters right and they're generally the guys that are shorter stock, you have that more powerful body and have that more explosive uh, fiber, um, muscle fibers. You know, you look at, even if you look at the UFC and you look at very successful strikers, right? Like you look at the Israel Adesanya's, the Anderson Silvers, the John Jones, they all have very similar body types where they've got long limbs and, you know, very reachy and they can make that work. The thing is though, to remember is that that is a huge component something you cannot forget about that is that at the end of the day skills pay the bills right and so if you put all of your focus onto looking a certain way you're probably not going to get to the level where that would even contribute to any type of success you've got to figure out okay well this is my body type this is how this is how this body type will probably be most successful in x sport and then you've got to train and that's where all the magic happens is the training over and over and over going to the gym every single day and turning up and rocking up to training and making sure that you're adapting every single day 365 days a year if you're not training and adapting you're recovering so you're adapting to the training through your recovery that's what a year-round athlete does and the best way to bulletproof your body to be able to do that is to put aside these body composition goals and think how do i put my body in the best position to be able to adapt as this adapt as this athlete as best as possible and the best way to do that is by looking after your nutrition and looking after your recovery and your sleep and all these other things because i think this is the next question that people to be thinking is going okay well how do i know if i'm you know putting these body composition and aesthetic goals before my performance and if you're someone that's always run down on energy you have crazy mood swings if you're a female and you're not getting a regular menstrual cycle or it's skipping or it's you know, very different between cycles if you're a guy and you don't have any libido you're getting digestive problems if you're getting hot if you're getting stress fractures all of these things can be indicative that you're in this state of lea or low energy availability and you're putting these body composition goals before performance if you're in that performance boat you should be able to train long periods of time without getting injured you should have a consistent mood you should be able to eat food and not get all these digestive problems, not be bloating and feeling terrible. You should be sleeping very well. You should have good, consistent energy throughout the day. Yes, you're training hard, but you should be able to get through those sessions and recover. All of those things are great signs that yes, you've put the performance shoes on and you haven't stepped over into, I want to just look this way. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I think, and what you said before, John Jones and Israel Adesanya are two great examples. Like, how much has it been discussed, or you know, other athletes say that Israel's skinny. You know, look, look, he's a skinny guy for the division, or John Jones has tiny chicken legs. Those kind of conversations. If those two, you know, world champions, absolutely, you know, arguably the goat to the sport. If they focused on what people were saying about their aesthetics and the way they looked. Then if they, you know, John Jones was just doing leg work to get his legs bigger so people wouldn't tease him or Israel just trying to put all that muscle mass, like, would they perform as well? But again, these guys who were like, you know, aesthetically aren't, you know, uh, judged aesthetically all the time, they're being these super jack, super ripped guys. So again, that's a perfect example of the guys are still in, in fantastic position, but maybe aesthetically don't look as amazing as other people, but are outperforming people. They're the world champions. They're yet most of them are yet to be beaten. So again, like what are we look what are we looking for? Are we looking for to be the optimal athlete? Or are we looking to look like the optimal athlete? That's the difference. Yeah. And I think what we think is of the optimal athlete now that we're progressing in sports science and the world is changing, we're moving away from that bodybuilder physique athlete mindset. We're starting to see that, right? Like we're starting to see like Israel Adesanya is what a world-class world champion optimum athlete looks like. The tall skinny guy is the best frame that you can have. And you look, even if you go over to other sports, you look at, you know, like throwing sports where you look at guys who are doing shot put, you look at those guys, and they are world-class elite level athletes. And yes, they do have a body that doesn't look like what you'd see in a physique athlete or a bodybuilding competition. And this is the thing, the more we learn about sports science and the more this field comes along, we're starting to understand and hopefully that message is getting out to people that you don't have to be super shredded. You don't have to have a six or an eight pack of be extremely low body fat to be in your best competition body. And quite often for 90 to 95% of people, your best competition body probably isn't going to involve you having abs. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. I think we just need to stop focusing on aesthetics and focusing on the variables that, that, you know, explain what we are as an athlete. Yeah. And I think one last thing, again, things that are going to be indicative that you are in your best performance body, you can get good sleep every single night. You wake up and you feel rested. You're full of energy throughout the day. Yes, you're training hard, but you can still get through your sessions. You've got good libido, females. Yes, you're naturally menstruating. You don't have any digestive issues that are outside of any intolerances or allergies. Mental health is okay. You're not experiencing crazy mood swings anywhere. You're free from any stress fractures. You're predominantly injury-free outside of what is normally expected of wear and tear from a decent training load for a full-time or partial, you know, partially full-time athlete. These are all things that are going to be indicative of, okay, you're probably nailing it. You're probably at your best performance body composition and you're at your best weight and going lower. If you have to sacrifice any of those things to go lower, then that's probably a good indication of, mm, that's probably not the best weight for you. 100% agree. Yeah, I think let's wrap this one up here, but very, very important topic to discuss. Love to hear your guys' thoughts. If you're listening to this and you have any other questions, you have any other inputs you want to put in, if there's something you want us to discuss even further, shoot us a message on our socials, shoot us an email, get in contact with us, shoot us a comment. This is a very important thing we need to start discussing more. And I think more athletes need to hear this, but I think this is a very good topic and we'll definitely discuss this more in the future. But Jack, thanks for coming on. No worries. See you soon.